Let's discuss all of this and more with Lawrence Tribe, Professor Emeritus at Harvard Law School. Professor Tribe, it's great to have you back again on the show. We've been checking in with you throughout these hearings whenever there is an inflection point of sorts. And I wanted to get your reaction to Thursday's hearing. It certainly concluded with a bang. Do you believe the committee accomplished what it needed to do? I think the committee did a spectacular job of informing both itself and the American people of a grave ongoing danger to the survival of democracy. This final hearing made even clearer than the earlier ones did, day by day, detail by detail, how the former president of the United States engaged in a premeditated plot to seize the election regardless of the outcome. He made clear, and his acolytes, people like Roger Stone and Steve Bannon made clear, and the committee enabled the American people to hear how they made clear, that they were planning and plotting that no matter what the votes were, the president, because he knew that the way votes come in, he would look like he was doing well on election evening, would proclaim himself the winner. And then when the future votes came in, the ones that had been cast on time but hadn't been counted yet, he would say it was all phony. That was a plan. It was a plan that under the federal statutes is a seditious conspiracy. Mm. And the committee made it clear that one man was at the center of it. His own personal responsibility was made very dramatically clear. And so he clearly has to be indicted, whether he will be indicted first for his dangerous theft of top secret materials that he planned to use for who knows what in Mar-a-Lago or indicted first for obstruction of justice as he is continuing to hide materials or indicted first for his role in the attempted coup and in the violent insurrection that we've just seen in great detail, that's not clear. But what is clear is that he must be indicted. Let me ask you about um, the subpoena here that was issued to the former president for a moment. Um, and, and we should note, you know, it's not without precedent. You had three other presidents, um, Presidents Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, excuse me, Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. They've all been subpoenaed. In your right. opinion and from your expertise, A, what is the likelihood that Donald Trump will testify? But more specifically, what legal recourse of action or legal course of action does the committee have if he refuses to do so? Well, the committee can do two different things. It can hold him in contempt or it can go to court. Actually, there is a third and very obvious thing because those first two take time. The most obvious thing is that it can draw the natural conclusion from his attempt to avoid testifying. That conclusion is that he's got something to hide and we know what he has to hide. And that is that he was at the center of a plot to overturn a free and fair election. The U.S. Supreme Court has made clear that even though you cannot use someone's refusal to testify against him in a criminal trial, so that when Donald Trump is tried for various crimes, his refusal to testify can't be used against him. It can and should be used to draw the logical inference that he is trying to hide his guilt. That's why he doesn't want to come. It's not because he's got bone spurs. It's not because, uh, it's not because he has forgotten too much. It's because he knows that if he is not going to perjure himself. He's going to have to convict himself. He's basically going to have to admit what we now know, and that is that he plotted to stay in power no matter what, basically to say to the voters, I don't care what you say, I'm, I'm the boss. Uh, and the committee will draw the inference from his silence, adding all of that to the mountain of evidence that has accumulated will draw the inference that he was at the center of a plot to overturn the election, to commit serious insurrection against the United States government. 
There's speculation that Trump, um, if he were to testify, he'd prefer to do it publicly. Would public testimony be beneficial to the committee, or is there fear uh, that someone like Donald Trump could turn the process into a spectacle? Well, he will try. You know, if he really meant that he wanted to testify publicly, I would take him up on his challenge. I mean, you know, come on. You know, you say you want to testify publicly. He's always said that. He said he wanted to testify before Robert Mueller. But when push comes to shove, he's a coward. Yeah. So he won't do it. But I think the committee should call his bluff. And if he testifies, he's going to lie. That's all he knows how to do. And he'll lie uh, under oath and commit perjury, adding to his crimes. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I think I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I'm with you on that one. I think he's definitely uh, afraid to, to appear in front of the public and, and field those questions and have to think live in the moment uh, without, as you said, perjuring himself. Um, let me ask you, Professor Tribe, uh, you know, a big part of this focus, and you brought this up as well, a big part of the hearing focused on the idea of premeditation. And the panel, um, you know, presented multiple pieces uh, of compelling evidence that showed Trump planned to refuse to cede power regardless of the election results, some of it based on close confidants months in advance. Let me just play for you one example of this. Watch. A few days before the election, Mr. Trump also consulted with one of his outside advisors, inside activist Tom Fitton, about the strategy for election night. The select committee got this pre-prepared statement from the National Archives. As you can see, the draft statement, which was sent on October 31st, declares, we had an election today and I won. And the Fitton memo specifically indicates a plan that only the votes counted by the election day deadline, and there is no election day deadline, would matter. Explain to us the significance of this kind of evidence when it comes to building a uh, possible criminal case against the former president. Well, the criminal case will charge that the president conspired with Fitton and with uh, Bannon and with Stone and with uh, others, including his own chief of staff, to steal the election regardless of the outcome, that if he doesn't win, He's going to claim that he won. That is a crime. It's a crime from many different angles. And part of a crime is that you have the requisite mental state, that you're not just stumbling into it, you know what you're doing. In the absence of this kind of evidence, he might have been able to say, well, I really thought I won. I was delusional. It's kind of a vague version of an insanity defense. It wouldn't have been very effective anyway, but now it's completely off the table. There's no way he can say that he really thought he won. We now have testimony that he planned, regardless of the outcome, to claim that he won. We have testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson that she heard him saying to Meadows that he was embarrassed about his loss. He didn't want to admit it. He was embarrassed about the nine to nothing decision of the U.S. Supreme Court turning back his last Hail Mary pass in an attempt to have the court intervene in the election. He didn't want people to learn about it. Well, that's all proof that he wasn't just inadvertently doing something. He was deliberately violating the laws of the United States, deliberately trashing the Constitution, making it clear that he's anything but repentant, that he will do it again if we give him the chance. So he certainly should be indicted, should be convicted. And quite apart from that, voters should take it into their own hands, both in the polling booth uh, and by bringing the kinds of lawsuits that voters in New Mexico did to disqualify a county commissioner from serving in office because he had been involved in the insurrection. You know, the Constitution, Article 3, uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that if you take an oath to, to uphold the Constitution and then engage in an insurrection against the Constitution and the government or give it aid and comfort, you are disqualified from ever again holding office. And voters in every state where someone who is involved in the insurrection, including the former president, tries to get on the ballot, have the option of 
bringing a lawsuit to keep that person off the ballot. So that this is not up to Merrick Garland alone. He has an important role to right. play in deciding when and where to indict, but it's up to voters as well. No, absolutely. A very important point. Uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe, it's always a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for your time, as Thank always. You.